Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Beautiful to be with everybody today, and I hope you're having a magical experience in your life. Today's show features the visionary scientists, doctors JJ and Desiree Hertak. Dare to Dream won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It is a high-ranking self-improvement podcast on Apple Podcasts, nominated for two People's Choice Podcasts Award and for a Webby Award. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. If you'd like to become a facilitator or you would like to just take classes anywhere globally, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R dot com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility specialist. I am a book writing coach, so I help you take your book from idea to published. I also have an independent company that takes books to a guaranteed international best-selling status. So if you've written one, get in touch with me and I can help you. And finally, I show spiritual messengers how they can take their message, their being, their business, and make it visible out into the world. It's exactly why we came here today. And, and for this lifetime, right, our souls signed up for it. So if you would like to learn how, I also do publicity work out in the world, but only for a small handful of people. So I really know this business. I myself have been interviewed on over 2,000 media outlets. Why don't you learn how? It's a beautiful free way to be visible and help people out in the world. I've got a free gift for you. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift and get your videos, your templates, your how-tos, PDFs, so you can start becoming way more visible. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. My guest today, J.J. Hertak, PhD, PhD, and Desiree Hertak, PhD, are founders of the Academy for Future Science. Dr. J.J. Hertak wrote the bestseller, The Book of Knowledge, The Keys of Enoch, and together they have written numerous books, including Over Self-Awakening and Mind Dynamics in Space and Time, the latter co-authored with physicist Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, examining quantum physics and the power of the mind. They have written so many books, contributed to so many books, including the Making Contact book. And Doctors Hertak have appeared on Netflix, BBC Radio, Gaia TV, Coast to Coast AM, Deepak Chopra's Wellness Radio on Sirius XM, Hay House Radio, and many others. If you'd like to learn more about them, go to keysofenoch.org or futurescience.org. And with that, I welcome Drs. JJ and Desiree to the show. Welcome to Dare to Dream. It is so great to have you. Thank you so much for the great introduction. We're honored to be here. And as you know, we are working in a very provocative subject that we're gonna talk about today in some greater depth. Absolutely, thank you so much. So I wanna kick start with this. Um, you are both spiritual activists. I really like the sound of that word. And you say that our positive intentions become a means for powerful change. We could really use that right now. So when we work by ourselves or in groups specifically, how can we transform our thoughts? What do you do to transform thoughts into positive reality shifts? Really, just the understanding of our tremendous energy possibilities that historically were connected with what the Eastern traditions called the seven chakras and the Western traditions, the seven seals, realizing that our body is a tabernacle of the divine spirit. And in so far that we can synthesize on many levels, the energy field, we can do more with the spiritual gifts that we have in the sense of making miracles for real rather than simply living in the intellectual sense of knowledge. Right, so part of what we do is teach a cosmology that we're really not only not separate, 
from each other on this planet that we really all are sparks of the divine but that there's also beings around us and i know later we'll talk about extraterrestrial beings and ultimately also we'll call them angelic or ultra terrestrial beings and mm. when you know that these realities exist you start worrying and wondering you know how can i get connected in a deeper greater level when you do that even just seeing the oneness then of the universe and the vastness of the universe your shift in consciousness takes place the oneness and the vastness of the universe and exactly i love how you said that divine sparks of light we are not separate not from anything out in the universe and galaxies not from source not from mama gaia planet earth not from each other so interesting does your use of remote viewing come into play in any of this and i understand that you have some semblance of knowledge in a lot of these things like remote viewing remote sensing remote influencing and so if you do engage in these practices these remote practices to experience the cosmos how does that work uh experiencing the cosmos and the infinite potential through use of that well let me start and we are scientists so we like the idea of quantum physics and more and more quantum physics is saying that there is all the possibilities in the universe are available to us and i think that's true for a planetary level as well as a personal level but what's exciting about all that as well is where is consciousness in all of this and we believe like many others such as roger penrose who's a nobel prize winner consciousness is more of a field lynn mctaggart talks about that and i highly recommend if you're really interested in the subject to look at some of the books she's written, like The Power of Eight and The Field. But the idea is that there's this field of energy. And so we're more like uh, radio receivers. We can tune in to what we want to. And we also, fortunately, can put that energy out into the universal field, the consciousness field. So really, we have a much greater capacity. When people remote viewed, and we worked with Russell Targ. In fact, Dr. Hertek wrote a book with him called End of Suffering. Basically, they discovered it's not like you're sitting here and then you go remote view Japan or something like that. You actually are part of that consciousness field and you are instantaneously connecting yourself to Japan without any delay of time. So it's very interesting to realize that, that we are part of everything around us. So we are really in an energy field encapsulated in the human form. We are a musical instrument. In my work years ago with some of the leading composers, including Ravi Shankar from India, in a variety of experiments of mind over matter, even out of body experiences show that we are connected with very subtle vibrations. We have music in our DNA. And if we can activate and use the energies within our body, within our incarnation into the physical form we call the human body, the human life form, we can begin to take our baby steps up the ladder of evolution, up the musical scale. And on the higher levels, we begin to experience what we call remote viewing without technology, distant places in the world suddenly come to mind. Remote healing, again, distant places or local places come to mind because of the energy sequence that we are able to synthesize. But this really answers a dilemma that we've had in the scientific world in the West in particular, which is denied the female side of the brain, which is the right-hand side. And in our intellectual work and in our research as linguists, as musicologists, we realize that this is really the portal that needs to be opened, the feminine side of the brain in conjunction with the male side, the left side, the analytical side. So it's the multidimensional side that has to be released. The mental locks have to be open. Otherwise, all of the information that we put together in our book, My Dynamics with Elizabeth Rauscher from Stanford Research Institute, The Real X-Files is meaningless. People have to feel experience. And so our methodology is to go beyond words into experience, feel the divine spark, collect the divine image of yourself and put it to work in the world of unity because this is the whole threshold of change we're moving into. You know, I love that explanation and uh, I'd never heard that before, that we have music in our DNA and you are singing to the choir, <laughs> so to speak. I have always felt that music was my first language and it's actually the filter through which I experience the world 
I understand harmony of things. It's how I even conduct interviews when I know when to come in, when to go out, when to let the aria, if you will, occur. I mean, music is one of the most important things in my life. So can you expound more? What do you mean specifically by we have music in our DNAs? Everybody, everybody has that and how? Well, well, it's exciting. You know, one of our most recent books, which uh, you said we wrote many, is called Sound. It's part of the Common Sentient series. And uh, it's kind of exciting. It's gotten very popular reviews on Amazon. In fact, it was number one in acoustics uh, of sound and physics or physics of acoustics and sound. And uh, one of the things we talked about was a personal friend of ours that we worked with. His name was Peter Goriath. In fact, right before he passed away just a few years ago, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize. And what he says is in our body, we have linguistic wave genetics. And so he saw, and this is not far out for your audience, but maybe for a lot of other people, that he felt that the DNA and the wave frequencies connected with it all come from a higher vibratory code structure. And the Keys of Enoch actually talk about even the fact that the divine name is coded in there. And that's back in the 70s. I know it's become more popular now with other when people. When you speak of the divine name, we're talking about the Hashem, yod heh vod It's on the cover of our book showing seven rays of light for the seven chakras that are energized in a unique musical way. So what Peter saw was there is this coding from our light body that then concretized into our physical reality. So our codes, and that's why sound and music, it's everything is vibration, everything is radiating, everything has sacred geometry around it. And it, the reason we have, we'll say five fingers and five toes, the reason why we look like angels is because we came from that higher reality and decided to come down, good or bad, <laughs> to this third dimensional reality. But everything that made us before actually then materialized into this reality and frequencies, light wave genetics is part of that. Mm hmm. Wow. Okay. So let's shift this a little bit over to some more cosmology. And I, in this moment, what is new? What can you guys share regarding the cosmology of alien civilizations and our multidimensional awakening? Well, many of you who are watching this program know what has happened this past year in June, July of 19, excuse me, 2023, going back to events in 1973, where I had a consciousness contact experience, which allowed me to write the Keys of Enoch, which presents a new consciousness cosmology that we're interconnected with many levels of cosmic intelligence. We are in schoolhouse Mother Earth. However, the doors of the schoolhouse have been largely closed as to our higher perceptual abilities. However, this past year, uh, a woman by the name of uh, Arville Haynes connected with the Office of National Intelligence released a nine-page report. I'm holding the top Actually, page. Of course, the report came out in 2021. Interesting enough, it goes back to start looking only at 2004, which was the famous Tic Tac uh, sighting off of San Diego, California. And But that's where they started. Interesting enough, the Keys of Enoch said, we're going to take a quantum leap in terms of understanding the cosmology of the world we're living in. In 2004, exactly right on schedule. So our book is the only one that, shall we say, in general language, predicts that there will be a scientific shift where younger people will ask those in authority, is it true that we are being visited by human-like and non-human-like intelligence? And of course, the question is, obviously, Plus, if we listen to the work of Dr. Gresh and others like him. Yeah, so Gresh actually, uh, David Gresh was actually with the military intelligence, and he was part of the UAP, which is another term for UFO, task force. And he was commissioned to go find out, is there anything to like Roswell and old, you know, sightings of things? There's a Kingman crash that came down. Supposedly, we got the the UFO from Kingman, Arizona, and brought it into Area 51. So is there anything behind this? This is what he was supposed to find out. And as some of you know, probably, he did find out that for tens of you know years, maybe going back to 1947, at least the 1950s, that the government has been covering up the fact of they have crash vehicles from non-human 
origin. That he used those three terms, non-human or two terms, whatever you want to call it, non-human origin. That really says it all. And the point being why he became a whistleblower is because basically, even though he talked to people and said, yes, we have vehicles. Yes, we've had them for a long time. Yes, we're back engineering. Yes, yes, yes. Can I, and he says, can I have the material? And they go, no. <laughs> so even though he was commissioned by our, you know, representatives and the Senate to bring this information, at least to private committees, he wasn't allowed. So this is why he came forward. So that's a big, big statement. Uri Geller has also recently, if anyone wants to Google him, he's come out because he, for a long time, he kept himself very, very private. He didn't want to say that he had some sort sense of contact when he was younger. Many people have had contact when they were younger because he wanted everyone to feel they can bend forks and spoons, but he did have contact. And now with all this coming out slowly with NASA having panels and we'll say the House of Representatives doing that great uh, three person, uh, two witnesses and one whistleblower testimony in July, you know, he's starting to come out and say, so we're at the brink of more and more people who have had contact in the past or have information now ready. In fact, I think there's 30 witnesses to government cover up just waiting to come out until there's what's called, they get rid of their non-disclosure agreement. So many of them have signed, their jobs are at stake, their pensions are at stake, even their life in terms of going to jail or not going to jail is at stake. And they're waiting for the House of Representatives and the Senate to agree that they now can get rid of that DOA. Yeah. David uh, Grush is the proper term as intelligence officer. Desiree corrected me. I meant to say David rather than Dr. Grush. But even before his testimony, I was working with astronaut Gordon Cooper, who in his book, Leap of Faith, published in 2000, he represents really the high end of research behind the scenes. He was able to give a testimony at the United Nations years before on seeing massive numbers of UFOs over Germany in 1951 when he was an experimental pilot. And I had the opportunity, excuse me, opportunity to also work with those behind the scenes in the governments of Mexico and Brazil who actually had space metal samples suggesting that many governments of the world are sitting on thousands of pieces of metallurgical so we say artifacts that do not match anything we could do on this planet. And of course, we also knew Edgar Mitchell. And even though when he went into space, he didn't see anything, although many have actually seen lights in the sky following spaceships, he didn't. But what was interesting about Mitchell is he grew up in Roswell. So mm -hmm. he, went, he went back after he was this astronaut, you know, to do the astronaut parade in Roswell, they're going, hey, you know, we know about what's up there in space. We had bodies, we had spacecraft, we had all this. And any people who actually witnessed it in Roswell came to him and said, look, this is what we did. This is what we know. This is who, what happened to us. So amazing. But what we also would like to talk about is not just the extraterrestrials that are frequently in this planet, but also kind of the orbs, the light spheres, the higher beings of intelligence as well. Yes, I have had personal experience with that during doing contact work uh, with somebody who channels extraterrestrials out in Arizona at a place that is very, very active. And I had so many things happen. We definitely saw a spacecraft, 100%. Uh, when we would take a break, I would use my iPhone with no flash, just literally to do some artistic shots of trees in the sky. And I was capturing not your typical orbs, not, not these small little beautiful bubbles, but something giant and milky that had like purple and blue running through it. It looked alive. And... Also, I was taking photos way out in the desert because we couldn't see it. It was pitch black. We were on sacred land. And I just wanted to see what was there. And I found I caught spacecraft on my camera. So, yes, I 100 uh, percent know of what you're talking about. And I'm wondering, why are they making themselves known right now? Is there an agenda? Is there a timeline that we're finally aligning with the rest of the cosmos for this to happen in an open way, meaning undeniable? Well, let me start just to say, when if and I encourage everyone here, if they haven't already heard it, to go to the hearings uh, from the House of Representatives that had Graves, Grush, 
and Favor, uh, they're talking about their sightings, but Graves was on the East Coast of the United States. And he was saying that, you know, for a long time, they looked around, saw nothing, and all of a sudden they upgraded their radar. And that's what we, we kind of do spiritually in a sense. You know, we upgrade our spiritual eyes or third eye or whatever you want to call it. We get our radar and they started seeing UFOs. And they thought, oh, this is just a fluke, you know. But then they started getting it on two or three. And they started looking at that exact place. They started getting in two or three different, you know, methodologies that they were observing off the coast of the East Coast, mostly Virginia. And then they said, yeah, now these UFOs are here, you know? So it's not just, you know, one person goes out and all of a sudden they're like looking at you, you know, you're looking at them. I mean, they're all over the place. In and we're, we're talking from the Hopi Reservation here in Arizona. So we have had contact with uh, indigenous people who have been in direct telepathic communication indicating that we are, so we're going through the end of a cycle, what I will call a plastic three-dimensional civilization. We are being prepared to be upgraded into what we will call a fifth dimensional side of human engineering in a, in a positive sense, not a negative sense. And we had also the opportunity to work with the indigenous in Central America and South America. I'm showing now to your audience a picture that many of you may have seen from uh, Campeche, Mexico, also in the year okay. of 2004, where we see us at the bottom on the top of the clouds, a series of some 11 unusual spherical forms. Now, one of the members of our organization, Keys of Enoch, was a Mexican airline pilot. He got the actual film. And this activity went on for some 30 minutes. Hundreds of spears were seen. And at that time in 2004, our colleagues were able to engineer a closer relationship with the uh, famous uh, journalist, I mean, Malasan from Mexico City, and the head of the um, military intelligence for the country of Mexico to release this information. But we were told by American authorities it was premature, people would be shocked to know all the realities that we captured on camera. But there in Mexico, on the East Coast, and there off of- uh, Virginia and Florida also. Correct. Yeah. On the West Coast. Yeah, the West Coast, we didn't want. <laughs> Go ahead. California. We have, we have in California, as well as Virginia, yeah. as well as Campeche, a series of events that match what I was shown in my experience of 1973, that there would be a timeline that would be lifted. And we would see the harbinger of light vehicles. We began to engineer a whole new physics, quantum physics. We began to change our psychology to accept in humility that we're not alone universe. And we would understand this also from what we would call the mystical traditions of the tree of life, that our solar system is but one branch of what the ancient sages call the Eskaim, the tree of life, we would grow up very quickly. And I think we're in that phase right now of uh, actively engineering a new psychology, a new cosmology, a new cosmic theology. Right, so let me add, you know, Dr. Jack mentioned Gordon Cooper, and we did work with him uh, on several occasions. His first contact was over East and West Germany. Uh, and he said that the Russians were flying like parallel to him. And when they looked up, they saw not just one UFO, it was a flotilla of UFOs. And so they were monitoring what was happening on, we'll say, the East and West German border. And I think that that's the same thing. There's, there's twofold. There's actually threefold, many reasons why they're here, because it's not just one form of intelligence. There's multiple forms of intelligence with multiple agendas. But let's talk about the positive ones. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I believe on Netflix, there's a new series from Steven Spielberg called Encounters, and he talks about the Fukushima sighting. We used oh. to talk about this because there was a UFO scene over Fukushima yes. shortly after. We believe, and this is true for Area 51 and also the area of the Trinity site in New Mexico, that they actually sometimes can neutralize nuclear weapons, nuclear energy. And they've done that in silos. If you look at in the work of, I think, Robert Sala and others, they basically are anti-nuclear 100%. I mean, 100%. I don't even know if, why they care so much about us. But, you know, I mean, that's other things we can talk about. But the idea is the fact that um, these are part and parcel of the energies of why they're here. Now, so yes, nuclear and war possibilities, they want us to stop playing games. Yeah. In fact, there was the head, is a general 
in the Israeli, I know Israel isn't popular right now, but he was an amazing person because he was into the space, uh, looking at satellites and space things. And he said that we've been working with them and that even previous presidents have wanted to come forward and talk about extraterrestrials, but even the extraterrestrials, this is what he said, his name is Haim Eshed, the extraterrestrials did not think we were ready for it yet. That's, this is, he made a yes. broadcast announcement about that. It's amazing. So basically warfare, we need to grow up. We think they're mm -hmm. also here for environmental reasons. And mm -hmm. I personally think, and that's my personal opinion, that the reason they were off the coast of San Diego is there's ridges that are connected with some severe fault lines. They could actually neutralize the buildup of energy off of California to stop this. They can also destroy meteorites coming this direction. So they can be working behind the scenes. And I know Uri Geller feels the same way, that they are there to try to help us to survive You know, to a certain point where we can graduate. Now, many of them function on a fifth dimensional level. They're fifth and dimensional. above, right? Some above. of them okay, are but I'm nice starting ones. starting on the basics here. But the so we're working on the third dimension and our minds actually can work on the fifth and above. In fact, uh, Elizabeth Rauscher used to say the eighth dimension, eighth space, she called it. Mm -hmm. Now our minds normally function in eighth space. But in actuality, of course, mentally, normally, we're not aware of that. But the ETs function in at least fifth dimensional realities as well. So we must exercise the positive gifts we have. And again, our work at Stanford Research Institute with Elizabeth Rausch and Russell Targ, some of the best minds in the world show that we have this intellectual and spiritual capacity to put two and two together, that we are on the cusp of a major change. We can take it negatively or we can take it positively. We know there are cultures there that are in rivalry as to the fate of the human race. But we know that the majority of cosmic cultures are positive. We would call them in the biblical language, B'nai Elohim, sons and daughters of the Most High or the Godhead that are part of what we will call a learning curve. And we are in that process of bringing humanity from all parts of the world, from all backgrounds into a general recognition that we need to have a positive psychology, a positive sociology and a positive cosmology that we're not alone in the universe. And this is the time to graduate, not to fall into the trap of wars, revolutions, and ethnic rivalries, but to see that we are all in the image of the divine, that we have a common destiny in space. If we want to bootstrap our knowledge quickly and to look positively at the options that we are being presented with. You know, and if we were indeed seated by the extraterrestrial races, which I strongly believe that that is a fact, and I believe in all the information about the DNA, or the human DNA being changed as we progressed, uh, DNA being extracted, being DNA being donated, and so forth, and that these are our cousins, the Pleiadians, the Ahiel, et cetera. These are our cousins, right? The, we're all from basically Libra Vegan mix. And so if that is so, we truly are not separate. This is just a, a family reunion of the benevolence about to occur. And I really agree with you for us to change our behavior on a lot of fronts so that this can happen. I know I would really like this to happen in my lifetime. And so you mentioned earlier the, and I never heard this word before, ultra terrestrial intelligences and so you... the curve of knowledge these would be the the, the management on the highest of levels mm -hmm. beneath godhead would be the ultra terrestrials those who have graduated beyond evolution those who exist in bodies of energy light energy we would call it superluminal energy as opposed to slower mm -hmm. energy einsteinian concepts relativity those who have learned to control entropy or the cycle of degeneration those life forms that are even beyond the extraterrestrials i believe are watching the games and the experiments of the extraterrestrials who have been called historically the gods of Rome, the gods of Greece, and the other traditions that unfortunately indulge in too much warfare and rivalry. And we're seeing really the consequence of thousands of years of inbred rivalries. And this is why we have to see our work as being, shall we say, beyond the historical frontiers as a unified humanity. And this brings us into the next chapter of one of our new books, I have close to my table here called Intergalactic Space Law, the next step up. If these indeed, as you said, are positive options we have, we have to have in place a engineering of 
not only international law, but space law that will give us the options of what science we trade off. What are our options with new, should we say, scientific building materials? My wife's father was a great uh, medical scientist who developed the first space medicine. So we can build hospitals in space. We can build on the frontiers of new planetary systems, a whole new civilization, if we have the right space law in place. And we have to prepare for that. Right. Well, I do believe there's many different forms of intelligence, but definitely some of them are just like us. They look like us. We're connected with them. In fact, the Keys of Enoch, and this goes back to 1973, says the Pleiades is part of the cradle and throne of our culture, our civilization. So th that's key. And then not too far from the Pleiades, of course, is connected with Orion. We believe Orion is like a gateway to other realities. So, you know, the whole universe around us is waking up and is <laughs> we're waking up to it, I should say. And of course, there are some levels of intelligence that are not as positive, but we believe actually we call ourselves the Adamic species and that's male and female and that we exist in throughout the universe. And we've been down here for 6,000 years, probably more like 36,000, maybe even a lot longer. In like, terms of intellectual history that can be traced as we have done in Egypt, in South America, we are coming uh, into contact with artifacts going way back. And so we're pushing the envelope into the back door of the, the Bible, into the front door of the future. We are beginning to rediscover that our ancestry is much longer on this planet. Well, we were just in Egypt and had a great time. I mean, we've gone many, many times. And uh, what, what's really interesting about Egypt is the fact that they have uh, gods that look like serp reptilian types heads, and they have others that look like bird type heads, and all of these other types of forms, especially in their solar boats in the Valley of the Kings. So these are all, they had contact with us. It shows biological diversity in the minds of the ancient Egyptian pre-scientists, but it also is a wake up call for us to be prepared to accept the fact that our form of life is just one of many. And a new film will be released in the not too distant future called Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. It's based on the book from Craig Capabasso, but this is going to be visuals, right? You're going to be able to see in ET what they look like in 82 in different species. Well, they're not going to cover that in the film, but I mean, a lot of very interesting ones, of course. So be prepared, fasten your seatbelts because it's <laughs> very That's beautiful. quantum change for most sociologists and anthropologists. Yes, especially anthropologists. We're watching that play out a lot with Graham Hancock. Um, and also, to your point, there is so much coming out of Mexico right now. I was just at a retreat with our friend, Adam Apollo, and um, his photographer who was there was showing me brand new things that have just been excavated from Mexico. So they're making a lot of alien extraterrestrial findings right now down there. I had a small hand in preparing Jaime Mossan to become the leading journalist in this whole subject back in the 1980s, uh, early 80s. He was skeptical at that time until we showed him, even from the area of Mexico and Guatemala, artifacts that clearly showed that there was contact in terms of the space materials. Space uh, metal that had no molecular structure. Right. It, was, it was a fine weave of very expensive materials like platinum and gold, something we couldn't engineer on this planet. So Jaime Mausan basically became the, the means and the ends of raising consciousness in Latin America to say, look, you guys, this is one of the contact areas that matches really the indigenous traditions of Central and North America. So we are looking forward to a major international Congress coming up not too distant future in Mexico City. And of course, some of the pyramids there align with the Pleiades. So they're you know on board with what we've been talking about. The ancients clearly understood. In fact, we've done something re recently on Gaia that's gonna be out shortly and uh it's on the bird man because the bird man is also all over the world but it was of course quetzalcoatl was considered you know the bird man with the serpent coming together that kind of energy but we and it matches also egypt and in fact the cosmology of the great pyramid dr hurtak in the 1970s said one of the star shafts or we'll call them air shafts if you're a more traditional archaeologist of the great pyramid points to orion and the other points to Draconis. Now it's interesting if you go back to the Mayan culture, they also considered Orion 
as like a godlike figure than mm. as a sacred figure. And they also considered uh, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, and Draconis as some of the problematic scenarios. So it's very, very interesting. I'm not trying to put too much out, but I also want to take the time to talk about you know, what you can see from those cosmologies, the world we're living in, we are living in a duality. I think more and more people start seeing that, knowing that, and it's all up to us because every moment is our moment of choice. So if we're living in a world of duality, the most important thing is to choose the right decisions to move ourselves forward. You know, we can do that with our intellect. We can do that with our heart, but in actuality, we should do it as I, I know you do, Deborah. Uh, with your higher self, your higher mind, with a little bit more guidance and insight. We call it the divine spark. And so we need a larger roadmap because we're presenting a lot of material and people somehow do not see how the left hand connects with the right hand, let alone the higher mind. It, in essence, requires a, a change within ourselves. So we realize we have a higher mind. We have a higher connection. Co connection. And when we see this larger roadmap, we can put things in proper relationships, like the tree of life symbol. And that connection really is not just, you know, with those who have passed over. I have a girlfriend that always says, well, you know, I think I was in touch with someone who had passed over my aunt, my uncle, whatever. I said, mm -hmm. you know what? There's so many more beings out there than your aunt and uncle. <laughs> you know? And they're, and really, if you tune into it and you're getting guidance by it, chances are it's like from the next level. It's from mm -hmm. greater realities. It's from higher heavens. You know, there's so many. But it depends on what frequency we're connected with. A lot of people say, well, how do I know that they're good spacecraft? Well, usually a good spacecraft would be positive. You can feel the energy. Any message is positive. If they're negative, then you can feel like you're a little bit afraid of it, you know, stay back. And again, and the musical sounds, as we illustrate in our book, take us to the higher vibrations. We've had the opportunity to work with some of the great musical composers of the 20th century, Alice Coltrane, uh, 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 Ravi Shankar, Andre Prep, and some of the others, and all relates to the drama of hearing the higher frequencies, the higher co-creativity spark that we have. And it's that in that higher arena, that we rediscover who we are. We are infinite beings in human form. We have this great energy field of love and light and compassion if you want to use it, but it has to be done positively rather than in fear. And the structures of traditional theology slash anthropology that are simply three-dimensionally representative of ages past rather than ages future. And just to continue to say, you know, we always thought of angels singing, you know, and making sounds with their trumpets or something like that. Well, basically sound is important. They're actually creating and transforming the universe through the power of sound. So these realities exist. And that's really our main message that in addition to extraterrestrials, which are extremely important, going to be seen more and more because of the crises that we're going to get ourselves into, especially with environment. But also, and I, I know you agree with this as well, that there seems to be certain veils or gateways mm -hmm. of higher consciousness mm -hmm. that seem to be opening. In some cases, it may be from a shift in the magnetic field strength on this planet. The Russians have done some research into that as well. But ultimately, we are able to know more, to see more, and to connect more with higher levels of intelligence. And that's also extremely important. And that's what's really going on right now. So those let of me you- ask, Let me ask you this. As, so you just held up this book, which uh, is so beautiful called Sound Profound uh, Experiences with Chanting, Toning, Music and Healing Frequencies. I know you're the main authors and the compilers of this book. How do you both personally use toning and chanting? Can you give an example or talk out an example? He can actually give you an example because I would love that. that. Are you able to do that today? <laughs> yes, I can do it as one who has been a cantor. I'm going to use a sacred expression. Oh, this is uh, called God or the Lord is here. Let us say the divine is here in this spark of vibration. So let me take a few minutes to intone this seven times with the seven chakras. Yes. This feel golden light flowing through your body. Recognize that our mind and our spirit and our body are our triple power, so to speak, of energy. And just to, while he gets himself together for that, I just want to say that we do feel that some cosmic names, even vibrations like Om or Om, as people would like to you know, say it, uh, it really does reach into the heavens. It aligns our bodies 
to higher states of awareness. That's why all temples, even temples in, we'll say in the Mayan culture, if you go to Tikal, it's known as the city of sound. They, they understood the power of sound and we've done testing inside a lot of the chambers and there's certain frequencies and that are resonant frequencies inside. And if they fix the chamber with modern, we'll say technology, you lose that resonance. So we believe some of the ancient names, whether you look at Shiva, or you look at other things like Shekinah, Shekina, divine that, presence. That this is a cosmic telephone line. You're resonating, vibrating on the frequencies. As the ancient scriptures tell us, there was once one language on this planet. And most linguists recognize that this is the seed syllables and vibration that we find in all the mother languages. And we have a lot of uh, CDs and music uh, to go with it. So with your permission, if we just visualize golden light pouring from the top of our head, our crown to the bottom of our feet. Let us realize that we are also way shores of light, presenting great love and compassion to all people for unity. And now we intone one of the sacred expressions. What a noise, what a noise, what a noise, let that energy vibration reach around the world, recognizing we are all, all sons and daughters of the Most High, the source of all sources, the light of all lights, that we shall use the musical vibrations to re-engineer, to, to reactivate, to reprogram and re-educate ourselves, that we are all vibrations of life and unity in the infinite way infinite mind and the infinite speciehood of a higher plan which is the divine in human form and so in addition to ourselves being here seeing ourselves as separate which we're really not we are connected literally with the universal mind so when i talked about the consciousness field it's not just the global consciousness field it's not just the local universal field it's the cosmic infinite mind presence. So we are unique beings that can reach into the stars, that can reach into the cosmic dimensions. And yes, Debbie said it's more than the fifth dimension. We agree with that. The 12th dimension, the 24th dimension, there's realms beyond any dimensions. These are all part and parcel of our reality. And those of you who want to know more, we put out CDs, MP3s, and uh, with yeah. this one, <laughs> Sacred Name, Sacred Codes with Stephen Halpern has been a bestseller worldwide. We have uh, literally over 70 albums that we have done, many of them award winning albums with leading singers throughout the world in all major languages, but including the biblical languages, because those are the most powerful when practiced with deep compassion and deep and sincere intention to help humanity. So, yeah. with that said, I want to say that musicology yeah. is musical language. We call it poetically the language of light is the connecting fiber of all these different fields, whether it's cosmology or Egyptology or the studies of ancient biblical wisdom, or for that matter, looking at pushing the envelope of extraterrestrial, ultra-terrestrial reality and experience. It is the music. And this is why we've been able to work with uh, leading musical specialists, even amongst the indigenous people. Ah, that's so beautiful. Wow. How can people do this themselves? Because what you just did, I felt. I felt it in every fiber of my being. I felt a shift occur. I felt an incredible peace come over me. It was just beautiful. And this is on Zoom with, you know, original sound for musicians. So this is not even hearing you in person, which would be something else. How can we employ this? How can we use this? I'm a singer. I would love to use it in a different way, but people even who don't sing, who would like to tone and chant and switch up frequency, what do you recommend? Well, we realize that meditation is one of the things we do recommend. And we realize that some people like silent meditation and, and that's good for as well. I mean, that's important to have that silent quietude, bring in energies and align yourself with what we consider the higher self, the higher Godhead, but also to use the chanting. Cause as I said, it's like a cosmic 
telephone line. And we really do have a lot of CDs that have some of these sacred expressions from all over the world, the East, West, North, South, uh, the new one with uh, uh, Stephen Halpern, as we mentioned, uh, ha yes, this is it, uh, basically has like Pachamama as part of the rhythms and the sounds in it, which is of course from South America. And really all of these were sacred vibrations to call upon higher, we'll say beings of light and uh, to align and help us because we want to say, we realize we're not alone. We realize we were a part of this greater cosmos and this greater reality. And it's also the compassion for the feminine side that's been lost that we have emphasized in our new music of the divine mm. names, of the inner divine, which is the female, as opposed to the outer divine, which is seen as the divine mind of the universe, usually in the masculine sense. But really, we graduate our experience of meditation through taking steps carefully in the biofeedback of how we use sounds with colors, with sacred geometry to evolve the tapestry of what the Old Testament mentions as the code of many Tell colors. Tell me what it is that you did with indigenous people around sound. Well, we were looking at certain seed syllables or sounds that were comparable to their sacred expressions. That is to say, we were building a language of communication and compassion by emphasizing the divine expressions that were central to, to that group, that tradition, that uh, we will call cultural milieu. And by using, for example, it with the uh, Jafanti peoples in Southern Brazil or the Zulus in Africa, certain sounds with the biblical language, there was a matrix that was created that opened the morphogenic field where the soul or the higher mind could actually step momentarily into another dimension. I get this is something that requires several months, even for some many, several years of musical training, but we all have this ability. We must be patient with ourselves and realize that our body, our spinal system is shaped like a musical instrument. So we are all potential way showers uh, of the work of the Good Shepherd, which is to say the way shower who shows the way through vibration. And I just want to say, even when Jesus wow. died, literally, there was the thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. This is all part of the sound that opens up what we would call the portals to ascension. So it takes like an opening frequency and it's not just one sound, it's multiple sounds that literally connect or we find allow you to In be all part. cultures, all of the top avatars and ma avatars are connected really with the soundscape of how divine and human come together in sacred experience. So to answer your question, one has to really relax, let go and let God or the divine spark sing within the heart. Realize your heart is a tabernacle. Realize your temple is a temple of understanding, not of bricks and mortar or walls, but the whole planet itself is what is called by one of the great prophets, the house of prayer, Mishkan Tefila. When we feel like vibration of unity with all people, I believe it's more easy for us to raise our mind to a higher level of experience. And I just wanna say, we use this energy that is able to also empower us mm -hmm. to do things on the planet. Cause I believe these higher forces, whether you look at Michael, the Archangel of Protection or Raphael, the one who heals, that these energies are here to help us. And if by calling upon them or calling upon the Godhead, whatever direction you normally go, you can send that energy out as well to help we'll say places like to do prayers for peace in the Middle East or a prayers of peace connected with Ukraine and Russia, or even to divert a storm. Uh, of course, there was a recent major storm in Mexico that hit Acapulco, but years ago, there was one in Puerto Vallarta, and we asked many people to join us in some of these prayers and meditations with sound, and the storm went right around Puerto Vallarta. So, you know, really fabulous things can be done. There was yes. a as Dr. Jack mentioned, we're here in Sedona. There was a fire. People were getting really nervous. So we said with a lot of our friends, you know, let's kind of project this energy. Let's change it. Let's, you know, neutralize it. And yes, knock on wood, of course, this the fire went away. So we can build walls of protection, walls of golden light in the Middle East. We can build golden light walls amongst the peoples in Ukraine and Russia who want to take the higher path. Yeah. And this is the positive psychology we must exercise. We must not live in fear and doubt and see this as a political, geopolitical game. No, it's each of us finding the, dispire, the divine spark 
to sing that vibration that goes with the spark and to realize the new self, new image of man is gradually moving from the old traditions of paradigm into the new, shall we say, fifth dimensional realization that we are whole life beings. We are musical beings. We are co-creative beings waking up to our cosmic potential. So how do you activate, you're talking about light beings, but we also have light bodies. How do you activate your light body so you can powerfully become this co-creator of, I feel like it should be a plural, new realities? I'm showing a picture from Mexico, Tulu, Mexico in the year 2000 approximately, where I was singing the ancient names of God in the Hebrew Aramaic and suddenly light came down on my body. It's quite apparent a man was taking a picture of his wife and pointing at the lower end of the screen and was able to capture in a few fractions of a second the light phenomena that came down over my body. And this is an illustration of the light garment. Changing garments is a mystical word, but the ability to, to harmonize in such a high level of devotion, love, that your body becomes really an encapsulation of this higher superluminal light. I feel that we're moving in dramatic times where people will have to pray to the divine for help. People will have to exercise the power of miracle working in the age of miracles. People will have to realize an ecumenical theology that brings people together through the great prophets, the great sages, the great poets. And people have to move beyond the traditional male oriented sense mm -hmm. of geopolitics into the female sense of balance, compassion, greater love, greater cognitivity, which we recognize in your program. I mean, you are illustrate with your sensitivity and your ability to reach out dramatically, realizing the gifts of music and sound to augment what we are doing all throughout the world. We are moving into an age of musical synthesis, an age of understanding that we have these divine cosmic powers if we wish to use them, but we must not be afraid of our divinity to we quote uh, Mary and Williamson. We must not be afraid of the dynamic of the higher divine spark that we have. And going back to what you were asking about the DNA, we've worked with Elizabeth Sartori in, in a book called Hollow Movement. And basically she and we all agree that we're part of almost like a musical keyboard. So right now we're in the fifth dimension. It's kind of like the base frequencies. And then when we start raising our consciousness more and more, we get into the higher frequencies. And yeah, our body that's physical actually transforms itself into light. Now, of course, light can appear at any time and we can be part of that light body, but ultimately, that's our evolutionary process to move into these higher frequencies and to move into the light. So we must move away from ne negativity. And again, I want to emphasize this book, Mind Dynamics as the Real X-Files, because the top scientists have shown mind over matter does work. We were able to change the way we think if we can quiet the mental chatter that is so negative to say, oh, you can't do this, you can't do this. No, we can do this. We can do more for life. That's why we're here as way showers to the dynamics of a new life that's being, I believe, being connected with the cosmic intelligence that's on our doorstep. So if we were to awaken our super conscious mind as multidimensional beings, we'd discover greater cognitive powers. Is there a way to guide and activate our non-local awareness as a gateway to remote viewing, remote healing, and remote influencing? Definitely. Well, we have a book called Over Self-Awakening. And that has what we call cosmograms or cosmic pictures. And it starts, though, as I said, first of all, everyone has to realize you can do it. The first blockage is, oh, it's not going to work for me. I, that's stupid. You know, that's not reality. We that's who we are. We are actually these cosmic beings. We've been dumbed down. I'm showing one picture here. We begin with the female form with the cloth over the face. The cloth is removed at the end of the book, and the beautiful female form appears, which represents really the divine feminine within each of us, but is able to connect with the heart centers of the world. So this process of visualization through sacred geometry, through the use of the color spectrum, the ability to think in technicolor, the ability to use a higher love force, and the linguistics of change, we call music linguistics as a new science, is able to move us quickly into the future. Otherwise, it would take years of study by a sage or by a great uh, savant, a person of uh, fantastic knowledge. Now, this can be done quickly by moving into a different energy field of positive change. And we actually think that we really already have this higher soul that's trying to communicate with us. But for the most part, 
We ignore that communication. Mm. So the more we listen to that higher communication, we should test the energy, make sure it's coming from the right source. And that soul is then trying to guide and direct us or as well as cosmic helpers that are also here guiding and direct us. We really can't do a lot of this alone. It has to be a co-participation. And if you wish to bring forth the power of Christ consciousness, that's fabulous because those who align with the Christ consciousness are usually those spiritual guides and helpers. If you wish to bring forth the power of the divine Godhead, that's also fine. So reach the highest levels, bring forth that energy and that vibration and receive that energy and know that it's coming from that higher source and then follow and that guidance and we literally will be in the right place at the right time it's and also called the important. zohar body in, in the kabbalistic mm -hmm. tradition yes the christ in the, the divine yeah. light the anointing power that we put on the zohar the splendor that we enter into even though it's momentary for many it's a whole process that i believe will lift us into cosmic citizenship so we're at a very dynamic point we can look backward and bemoan the great tragedies, or we can go forward with remote viewing, remote healing, remote communication, and upgrade humanities. And that moment, that decision is now. And I just want to say, we're in the middle of, of course, this horrible situation going on in the Middle East, but a friend of ours who's a Christian, actually, but he goes to Israel quite often, he was going to be going to the wards of the South. It just happened to what he was going to be doing. And all of a sudden, he got this insight to know, don't go there, get on a plane and leave. And, it, you know, everything seemed fine. Like, okay, that's really He was stupid. on the same road <laughs> used by the terrorists that crossed over the Gaza frontier. But I believe if we're going to use our intellectual minds, it's, we're not going to make the right choices that we need to make. If we're going to use only the heart, which is the fight or flight. So paraphysical well, sensitivity is necessary. Yeah, we need, yeah. If, Sociological if, understanding, if, compassion is necessary. You have to see the big picture of your new self. And that's where remote viewing comes in, because once you realize you can tap into that consciousness field, then you realize, hey, there is something out there. I can do that. And why can't I get even more information? Let me ask you about this higher thinking you're talking about, Desiree, because you've worked extensively in Egypt, you've worked extensively in Mexico, and you've also hosted a panel at the United Nations Summit, where you presented and you have lectured all over the world. Why are these important conversations that you are engaging in and offering? And if critical thinkers were to listen to what you are suggesting, what changes would be possible? What changes could your information create? Well, that's, uh, you know, I believe there's a solution for every problem on the planet. We're facing quite a few of them, mm -hmm. whether it is war, politics, economics, or environment. Each one of these areas, strangely enough, is being blocked in some way. Look at even just energy technology. Look at the car industry, you know, how much work it took to even get to EVs, to electric vehicles. We're actually in support of hydrogen. Hydrogen has been the lagging place for a long time, but we could actually run our houses and our cars all on hydrogen, and we can almost do it exclusively and locally because salt water now works to make hydrogen. It's just one sample. In fact, we have a book, another book called Giza's Industrial Complex, which actually says that we believe the ancient Egyptians used hydrogen gas. And we have a lot of ways of looking at it and a lot of evidences in the book. Uh, in fact, we challenge people to say we're wrong, but it's so simple. It, a high school student can make hydrogen gas from water. So or to answer you, water. because of our time, we're making a big preparation for a change coming. The big quantum changes. And we have to see that we're going from humankind to space kind, mm. from local homo, homo sapiens sapiens to homo universalis, universal yes, humanity. Yes. That requires courage, humility, but greater love. And so my words, and Desiree also to all of you, is to take the higher path. Mm -hmm. Turn on the greater love. Do the daily meditations. Be in constant prayers using the mantric musical exercise that we have in our books and our musical CDs and DVDs. Understand that we are at a time where we are the avant-garde of a great change coming to Mother Earth. And the old systems of geopolitics are not sufficient to work. They will not take us through the critical changes. The higher consciousness will the higher consciousness, which is God-centered and connected with the cosmology of the tree of life, we believe will because of our experiences, which we've documented behind the scenes and the work with the astronauts 
And many of the atheistic sciences to change became more spiritual when they used the mantras of the divine. And everyone can be in touch. It's not, you know, a few people here, a few people there. Everyone can do it. Remote viewing is a step one. It's, it's the first baby step, but then realizing the higher consciousness is part of you and you're part of it. All of you are part of the future. You are part of a divine family. You are part of the quantum change. At Astra, as the ancients say, to the stars. And I want to make sure we get this in. You will be at the Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo 2024. You're there every year. What are you going to be speaking about, about in February? Well, we do both because uh, we also join with Alan Steinfeld, I know a mutual friend and uh, author of the book, Making Contact. We wrote a chapter in this book. It's really very interesting if you're interested in extraterrestrial data. And but we'll be sharing some of the musical biofeedback experiments that we did in Egypt and uh, Mexico. But we also do remote viewing, uh, even uh, little ex exercises in remote viewing for the audience because it's so important that we realize we can all do this. I mean, one of the greatest uh, remote viewers at Stanford Research Institute was a woman named Hella Hammond, who was a secretary down the hall. <laughs> you know, So in other words, they got her. She had no knowledge about any of this, but she was fabulous. She was taking people on walks around the Kremlin accurately in terms of her remote viewing the building. <laughs> so I, anyone can do everything. And I just want to throw out the idea that Ingo Swan also remote viewed Jupiter and he saw rings around Jupiter prior in 73, and uh, they were only confirmed in 79 by the Galileo and the Voyager probes. That is a very cool fact. I love that. Okay, and we are all going to be speaking at the Mexico City UFOlogy World Congress event. It's December 1st through the 3rd. By the way, everyone listening or watching, there will be links in all the show notes, so if you'd like to attend, highly recommend you do go to these events if this is your conversation and see us hear us speaking on stage what will you be doing there well we like to show some of the images of extraterrestrial beings so people get an idea you know they do many look like us some are elongated skulls some have other types of i forms. released the first pictures in 1979 of some of these beings that the mexican authorities had is documented on the front page of nova Dadis, which is their New York Times Magazine newspaper. So we will be able to bring out some of the uh, historic materials that sharpen the views of why Washington is being busy to prepare people for what I will call a new anthropology. But please join us also because December 4th, there's a Monday outing for that conference, which we're managing. We're going to be taking some people down to Teotihuacan to see the pyramids. So if you'd like to do that, please, Debbie, join us. It's going to be fun and it's going to be a great opportunity to do that. It's not very far away. It's pretty much Mexico City because it's so elongated. <laughs> now, is this one of those pyramids that you climb up these enormous steps? There's no rail and there's... Yeah, sadly. And I don't know, you know, the last time we were there, they're starting to crack down and not let people climb all over Mexico. I mean, no matter where you go. I heard that. Um, so I'm not sure what we're going to be able to do on that particular day. But it's a, one of the most amazing sites. It's one of the largest pyramids in Mexico. You have actually three pyramids, which is similar to uh, what you find in Egypt. You have the Pyramid of the Moon, the Pyramid of the Sun, and then you have Quetzalcoatl. And we believe on the sides of Quetzalcoatl, there's a coding for the fact of us going from the dinosaur age to the computer uh, age, to the robotic age. We think it's all encoded on Quetzalcoatl's pyramid. Amazing, I love I love the brilliance right up into the end. I wrote down this trip. Um, yes, this sounds incredible because I am staying there a few more extra days. So- Avi Lo from Harvard will be there. I mean, Mao San will be there. And Michio Kaku, of course. So all of the people who yes. worked diligently behind the scenes, again, we only say if you can take time to go to Mexico, you will understand why Tenochtitlan, all of the uh, traditional mythology is really a code word for a, a higher science of cosmic reality that's meeting us on the doorstep of all the major countries of the world. So be blessed. Thank you so much for having us as your participants today and may the divine spark be in our hearts always. And we'll see you in Mexico. I'll see you in Mexico. And I want to ask you real quick here in the end, this is Dare to Dream, JJ, Desiree, Doctors Hertak. What are your next Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? 
we are working on a series of books uh, connected with things I was told not to publish back in the 1970s about things that will come. Revelatory findings that will be made in uh, Egypt and in Israel. A hint, hint, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, documents in the pre-Exodus period, rooms inside the pyramid not recognized until recent times, investigations that we have done behind the scenes. Again, those of you who are interested, we found the tomb of Osiris in 1970, 97, two years before it was officially uh, released, released yeah. by uh, Dr. Hawass, recognized us that we were one of the, the pioneer teams using radar and music. And that's in our book, Jesus Industrial Complex. So all of that will be part of an ongoing series of documents that we will do on film as well as uh, through books showing that we're just at the very top of the underground civilization that was there buried in underneath the sands. But I want, I want to say about everyone, it's important to be here now to realize that this is a key time of transition. We feel we're getting closer and closer to what we call the day of graduation. So all of us, I think you too, Debbie, are working towards the awakening of humanity and the preparation for our contact. Mm. Thank you both so, so, so much. What a beautiful conversation. And folks, if you would like to learn more about them, keysofenoch.org. And I end the show with this quote from Drs. J.J. and Desiree Hertak. The seriousness of the situation in the Middle East should awaken the world to more prayer and special prayers for divine intervention. Now is the time to call on the divine forces as this is what we can do best to help the people of the Middle East. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit in your Shekinah glory, help bring peace to all that suffer. Come, all divine servants of peace in the names of the Prince of Peace, as we use the words of Sanctus Shanti Shekinah. And you can say those 12 times, holy peace presence, may peace be with us all. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment and share. I read all of them. And next week on the show, the guest coming back for, I think the fourth time, is the amazing Daryl Anka. You might know him for his channeling of the Sasani being named Bashar. Don't just dare to dream, dare to be a divine spark of light at this very important time.